Uh, my name is <coughs> Nigel Neal, and I wrote the script of this movie uh, a long time ago, about 35 years ago. And it was based on a TV original that I had also written uh, a few years even earlier than that. I am Roy Ward Baker, and I directed this movie. Originally, my story was just in a, a building site where they had dug very, very deep. But uh, in Roy's version, we have a tube station, an underground station being constructed. And that was the suggestion of the a very good man, Anthony Hines, who, who thought of it. Thinking back it, 30 years, I remember thinking when I read the script that it was a, a natural movie, in spite of the fact that it started as a, a written story and then become a television series, a very, very popular television series. Nigel, one of the things that interested me at the time was that the television series ran for six half hours. That's three hours altogether. Yeah. Whereas our movie runs 90 minutes, which is an hour and a half. Yes. How do you... Uh, of course, it didn't worry me. It didn't concern me at all. But I'm curious to know whether you were happy about shortening it, condensing it, I don't suppose I was at the time, but it, it had to be done. The only way to get it down to feature film length, something had to go, quite a lot had to go. But it was mainly a, a matter of compression and not allowing uh, things to expand themselves, scenes to expand themselves too much. The girl in the pink coat there's a girl called Sheila Stiefel. It was the first thing she ever did in movies. Yes, I remember her. She became quite famous. We well, think that's not scapular. Huh? James Donald, who was in Bridge on the River Kwai, a number of other great movies. A fine man and a, a yes, tremendous uh, actor. Excellent. Thanks. Very sensitive actor. Yes, yes. There's nothing flamboyant about him at all. He was absolutely right for this part. Yeah, there he is. We were very, very fortunate on the casting of the whole, the whole thing, yes. right from top to bottom. We managed to find the right people. Barbara Shelley was the ideal, was the professor's assistant. The fact is, I need your help. In the last two days, my assistants here have done wonderful work, and we've unearthed a lot of valuable stuff. Valuable? How valuable, Dr. Rudd? To science? I can't tell you, but I, I do know that this is one of the most remarkable finds ever made. Now, what I want of course, to the, <clears throat> one of the things that was quite a problem, uh, logistically, as they say, was the, the business of building the underground station. Yeah, or, or what appeared to be. Yes. There again, I think your your requirements were very interesting and very clever in the in the presentation side of it because we never actually had to show the whole thing at one time. Yes, I remember Tony Hines' idea 
was that it should be an old-looking station on a semi-disused line, which is now being improved and extended, uh, and um, that which, of course, gave complete freedom uh, for you in that sense. That it it, uh, it wasn't a, it wouldn't uh, have trains running through it, anything <laughs> like that. Uh, wouldn't have, that could have been really much worse. <laughs> it started some uh, something. But um, it was the, probably the end of the line, I should think, being extended into the 21st century. I'll tell you one, that one of your neat touches, one of the neatest touches is later on in the story when a train goes by on the parallel track, which we never see. <laughs> so all we hear is the noise of the train going by and everybody has to start shouting because they can't hear each other. <laughs> but well, that was it, yours. It gave, <laughs> well, no, it, it, it gave... Uh, validity to, yes. the, oh, yeah. to the setting. Yeah. yeah. The two trains running over this side, bones and all. The lady Before with the grey hair is B. Duffel. Oh, who's yes. a charming woman who was, was in uh, A Night to Remember. She was one of the Irish she immigrant. Mm. There were still bombs being found at that time. 1967. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, there still are now, but very, very yeah, few. But 1967 is a fairly regular occurrence that uh, some old German bomb would be suddenly discovered and everything would have to stop. Oh. The district evacuated, the army move in, get the experts on it. And uh, a, a thing like this, a mere uh, investigation of uh, fossils would, of course, be on hold while the bomb was <coughs> investigated. And the Germans had been using some gigantic bombs towards the end of the war. And if they found something big and shiny, uh, there was a big alert on. Let's try and tear it all up. Well, that was another facet of the story which fitted in beautifully with the with the general run of the yarn, the um, determination by the military that this must be a bomb, and yes. a UXB, which was... Yes. It is not. <laughs> and they had routines moved quickly in on it, oh, yeah. and uh, which gave them a kind of mindset that it must be what they were looking for, which was a yeah. bomb. Yes. And it was very difficult for people in charge to uh, think any other way, yes. certainly not the way we were going to suggest. So it can't be steel. Oh, they're all quite determined that it must be a U UXB. It couldn't be anything else. Yes. We'll dig down a bit. Let the dog see the rabbit. Hmm? Corporal Gibson, two men with shovels. Right, Sergeant. All right, Webster, Jenkins. Could you tell us a little about the genesis of the Quatermass character? Five minutes. Well, the original, well, of course, he went back a long way to 1953 when I did the first Quatermass story. And uh, what was the... Uh, a troubled scientist, that's the way I'd written him. And then, because it was the time when the uh, the H bomb had just come on the scene, and the Russians were actually producing it too, there was a lot of fright in the world. And uh, so I wanted a, a scientist who was on the the edge of terrible investigations and having to face the the mindset of the military yet again who would use space exploration for their own purposes they were after all the moon going to the moon was just about possible to think of not as a thing that would happen then but a few years later as in fact it did um, and this man is civilian uh, a pure scientist i uh, i use the name I called him Bernard Quakermouse because um, after the uh, director of the 
huge new Jodrell Bank Space Telescope, Bernard Lovell. And um, my man was a creature with a conscience, had a horror of what his rocket research establishment was going to be taken over and turned into uh, as a, a piece of weaponry that these ruthless people would use space exploration purely for military purposes. Uh, as it turned out, as it has turned out, maybe that is not going to happen at all, but let's hope so. But that's what he was frightened of. There's a very, uh, in, in, what gives uh, Pratamas added interest is that he is a bit of a rough diamond. Yeah. He is not your usual um, university professor. Uh, he's uh, certainly a liberal. Oh, yes. If not a left winger, but, uh, and he's no sympathy with the militaristic feeling no. of the times. None at all, particularly when you've got somebody like uh, Colonel Breen, who is a, a, yes, this a one. young, pushy achiever in the military and um, doing very well for himself and determined to use the whole space scene such as it was. There never was anything much in England, but there was a bit of that, even then, at that time. Um, and to turn it to his own purposes, or the what was then called the War Office and is now called the Ministry of Defence. Why not have dinner with me in my club? Come. And of course, in construction, this was my way of getting Quatermass into the story. Indeed. Well, that works perfectly plausibly. No, no, no trouble with that at all. Julian Glover, that, that chap. Yeah. That plays. Yeah. I found him when I was doing The Avengers. He really? was in one of those episodes for yeah. The Avengers. He's now a very well established actor. The practical side of the sets was um, another thing that worked quite naturally and very well because. The art director was a man called Bernard Robinson, who was very, very famous. It was almost the last thing he ever did. Was it? Uh, because he wasn't a fit man. Mm. But he had uh, been the Hammer art director for years, many years, and had done dozens of pictures for a highly practiced man and very practical. Could conjure sets out of nothing and nowhere. So he was an asset. Because all this had to work, it had to yeah. say what it was meant to say. Any guesses? Possibly a German V-weapon. Why? Flying bomb? V-2 rocket? Uh, it's not either of them. Obviously. But those weren't the only surprises they cooked up in the war. More than anyone knew. Sir? What is it? Well, no. It may just be a stone. Because when it came to building the sets, um, one of the requirements, obviously, is to have a good studio. Well, at that time, Hammer were making all their films at the old Elstree studio, at Boreham Wood, which is not Elstree at all, we all know that. Anyway, um, it so happened that when the picture was ready to go, and we got the green light, we were going to make the film, the Elstree studio was full, and there was no space to make it. And then we discovered that just up the road was the Metro Goldwyn Mayer studio, which was infinitely larger, infinitely better. Mm -hmm. It was brand new, practically. It had only been opened after, after some time after the war. And uh, they had nothing in the studio. So we moved up there, and we had the whole place to ourselves and all the resources that were within it, including the back lot, which was far bigger than the L Street back lot. And uh, so that was, uh, again... A real bonus. Yes. No, that's this really, sort of yeah. film, mm. it all sounds rather mundane, but nevertheless you do have to have these practical considerations. And they uh, have a lot of bearing on the final success of the, of the Enterprise. It was here in the clay. When the missile struck, it got round through. 
He's so good, Andrew, you know, he really yes. is. Dr. Roney, my name's Quedimas. Are you one of these bomb experts? Mm, not exactly. Miss Judd here will look after you. How do you do? Hello. I've got to get this color. The one thing I'm awfully pleased it's about is they do look like proper soldiers. Yes. yes. Actors, generally speaking, <laughs> just between the two of us, are not notorious for being good at soldiers. And it is necessary. Well, different people, after all. Yeah. Good people. <laughs> and there, were, there would be a, a, a highly trained squad uh, who dealt with bomb disposal and went straight in and knew exactly what to do. Oh. Except for this time, because it wasn't a bomb at all, but uh, had them very baffled. Now, you're quite certain. There were no AT bombs on the street above here, sir. Yes, they acted very well as a team. You, I, yeah. I really believed that, you know, that um, these boys were a group of four or five people and they really knew the business. Oh, excuse me, sir, but that's not quite right. Oh, fine. Well, those houses were all abandoned years before the war. What on earth for? Well, people just wouldn't live there. Some kind of scare. Scare? Uh, superstition. A lot of nonsense, I dare say. There, that's done. Now, I do think you ought to get a breather. The air's terrible down here. All right. But just for a minute. These are the houses, sir. And what's left of them? They really are derelict. Hmm. Now, give me that torch, will you? Thank you. I must warn you, these buildings aren't safe. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless. Tell us a little about the Quatermass TV series and about the films that preceded this. Well, Andrew Keir was the um, the first English, or in his case, Scott, to play the part um, on film. We had three different English Quatermasses in the three television versions. And then there was Brian Dunleavy, American. Now, in fact, he was born in Ireland, I believe. And uh, he played it uh, in the first two Quatermast um, films, which were given quite different titles for American distribution. And I didn't like his performance. He was not the man I had written. Uh, Andrew Keir was. <laughs> Those marks, what could have made them? Kids, uh, kids playing around made them. Mr. Baker, was uh, Kenneth Moore ever considered for the part of Quatermass? Well, the casting, um, <coughs> casting of this picture, as far as I know, was um, we had a very good casting director called Irene Lamb, and um, obviously the producers were most interested in who plays what, particularly the leading parts, because they go on the poster and all that sort of thing there those considerations. Um, I honestly can't remember very well um, what uh, range of actors were considered for the part. Um, I think a lot of the work had been done before I was given the script and offered the picture to do. Um, it's true that uh, uh, Kenny was a great friend of mine, and we've made at least two pictures together. He had a small part in Morning Departure, and of course he played the leading part, the central part, in um, A Night to Remember. And he, by this time he'd become a big star. So if he was considered for it, then it's possible. But I wouldn't have... Um, I don't think I would have um, been an advocate for him 
playing the part. He hadn't got that rugged, rough diamond, rather tough uh, kind of feel about him. It's too charming, too nice for this part. Um, so I, I can't answer the question, really. I suppose I don't. If anybody would ask me, you know, what about, would you, hadn't you thought of, of Kenny Moore for it? I can't answer it. I don't know. I don't think so. Certainly Andrew was, to me, was accept not only acceptable, I was glad to have him. Yes, he's very, very good. Uh, he and I did a sort of radio retrospective last year, about a year ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, doing... Oh, sorry, I missed that. Uh, about uh, oh, half a dozen pieces on the radio, uh, in which he uh, plays the character of Quatermass, long retired... Uh, as he would be, yes. uh, and um, explaining how it all happened, going over the the whole trio of stories, that, uh, quite a lot of stories, uh, interspersed with bits from the BBC archives of what was actually going on in the 50s, uh, including the Hungarian uh, rebellion and um, various... Uh, advances in the building of H-bombs and so on. Oh, I'm sorry. Bring us up to date. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, he, and he was very good. He, was, he swung back into Professor Quatermass like anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a good part for him to play. I mean, him to part. Uh, actors dream about things like this. It's a pivot of the story and he's... The one who's carrying the whole thing. The only odd thing about them is the great size of the skull. I've got it all charted uh, somewhere. Where the devil should she keep everything? You're Miss Judd? Yes, I told her to take the day I'd, off. It was rest. interesting to me because um, I'd never made up a picture with a science, science fiction basis before. Um, I'd made several dramas and um, several two or three, which were basically documentary. They were realist in, in, their, um, in their field, in their style. They were like a natural member or the one that got away, and those, those sort of films were based on fact. And I think that um, that helped me a lot, incidentally. That experience helped me quite a lot with a, a picture like this, with a story like yes. this. Because it had to be, you had to believe it. Yes. Uh, if you don't believe it, then there's nothing. There's no movie at all. And I, I, I had no, no. Personally, I had absolutely no difficulty in believing it at all. And the first time I read the script, I thought, this is fireproof. This is a real, absolute win winner of a script. I knew very little about the previous uh, Quater Masses. I'd seen them on television. But there was, as you say, quite a, a long gap between, say, the first the Quater Masses on television and, and this, the last of the Quater Masses on movie. Well, the thing about them was that uh, all the Quater Mass stories were essentially earthbound because they came out of, uh, of the television live studio originally. They were all done live. And uh, with some considerable skill, I may say. Yes. But... Uh, the, what we didn't have were masses of special effects. We just simply didn't have them. No. Uh, the very first great mass, I did the special effects myself. Um, and the, <laughs> the second one, we had a crew of two special effects boys in the BBC. And they were good. And this one, the third BBC version, we had uh, an expanded team who were very good too. But always, the thing was, you couldn't have a sort of Spielberg mass of special effects. We simply didn't have it at all. So the tradition of them was that the story was something that happened on the Earth, preferably in London or nearby, and the, uh, any kind of extravagance was something equally earthbound. It all happened here. We didn't go into space, at least not much. We did in the second one, slightly, on the BBC version, not at all in the Hammer film version. So the BBC version was, in fact, 
fractionally more extravagant, except we ran, out, ran completely out of cash. We took terrible chances, actually, in all those BBC versions. So it was a great luxury to see this being done in a beautiful big studio on film. But of course, we are back in the days before a man was put on the moon and space was something for H.G. Wells or whatever, but um, even that, um, as far as movies are concerned, kept well out of the idea of space because it's virtually impossible to, or was in those days, impossible to reproduce it. Yes, it was. I, mm. I ran slap into it when I started trying to make another film for uh, Hammer called Moon Zero Two, all of which takes place on the moon. Mm. And um, we first of all discovered that there was never going to be anything like enough money to create the atmospheres and the, the reality of the thing, nothing at all, we couldn't do it. And then, of course, when people <clears throat> got serious about it, with the experience of the of the real putting of a man on the moon in America, then you had all the Hollywood resources behind it, and they were able to, at last, they were able to do something that was convincingly space yeah. fiction. But we couldn't do it, and the, the special effects were very, very limited, and they're mostly people pulling bits of string, you know, yeah. flashing lights and, and jumping the camera about and doing all the primitive things that, you know, people were doing right in the early days of the movies. Same thing applied to uh, a, night, a Night to Remember, incidentally. But um, that, again, that was, that was all right because the, the requirement was, to a certain extent, limited by keeping your stories earthbound. It was a... A great piece of good fortune for everybody else concerned that you did. Well, it, it saved us all a lot of trouble, yeah. believe me. Could be a warhead, says Colonel Breen. Hello. What made these marks? Marks? Well, not us. This stuff's harder than diamond. We've tested. Well, it seemed to be. This was your first film for down. Hammer, and uh, could you tell us how this came about? Um. I made my first, directed my first feature film in 1946. And so by this time, it was 1967. I'd been to Hollywood for three years. i uh, done a lot of experience there. I made four pictures. And um, so by this time, I suppose I'd been a director for 46 to 67 years, whatever it is, 20 years, I suppose. And, um, so I suppose my name was on the list, and eventually they rang me up. That's how I came to be involved. Tony Nelson Keyes rang me up. He's the producer of the film. And um, showed me the script. And um, I was about to say, I'll do this for nothing. You know, <laughs> I was so impressed. But I didn't say that, fortunately. Oh, I kept my head. <laughs> well, I didn't write it for nothing, but nearly. <laughs> Oh, yes, there wasn't a lot in it. Not in those days. We were underpaid and overtaxed. Yes. That's the trouble. If I can get through that bulkhead, I won't need Try Borazon. It's a lot harder than diamond. Can you get hold of a Borazon drill? Would need getting hold of a civilian operator. <laughs> of course, as far as I'm concerned, this, this uh, picture was... A, a roaring success and um, because it had all those qualities of cast and script and everything that you had to have for a roaring success and so I became very popular with um, Hammer and uh, I can't remember exactly what the succession of the pictures was but I went on from picture to picture with them it was the one with Betty Davis which um I enjoyed doing it. Was um, it was a difficult picture in the sense that it was a stage play, and uh, there, were, there was nothing one could do with the movie except photograph the, the stage play, which is what I did, and it was all right. That was okay. Um, and as I say, Moon Zero Two, which was a failure, 
but uh, no, I don't think it surprised anybody very much because in those days it was virtually impossible to make such a film with the resources that were available at that time. And um, so I went from picture to picture. It was a very happy relationship. I liked all the people. I was most impressed the first time in connection with this film. I was most impressed when I, the first time I went to the head office, which was in Water Street in London. And the uh, first thing I noticed was that they owned the building. But the second thing that I discovered, which was a source of great admiration in me, was that there were only about five people in the company. It was Jimmy Carreras, Tony Hines, Bernard, I can't remember that, the third man. It was Michael, of course. Uh, Michael Quite Carreras. But uh, Michael was not directly involved in many of the pictures at that time. Uh, much later on, he took over completely. But, but, um, but it's always been a family firm, I think, hasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the originals were uh, Carreras, uh, senior, and uh, Tony Hines's father, who was... Will Hines, yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, who was a, a kind of showbiz struck jeweler. That's right. Yes, he, he was. He was. He had two very, oh, he had a chain of very successful jewelry shops yeah. all around the country. And, but he had a, a great urge to be on the boards. He used to do, he was a, a kind of red nosed performer, more or less. Yeah. And he loved it. And he loved show business so much, he teamed up with Carreras to found a film company. This was way back in the 1920s, I think. And uh, oh, yes. he continued as a jeweler, on the other hand. Uh, so he had it both ways. Tony then in eventually inherited his part of the firm, and with the two careerists. One inhabitant had complained that the cert he had oft despised the apparition of a hideous goblin. But you see, I'd, I'd, I, before this, I'd uh, well been to 20th Century Fox. I worked 20th when I was in Hollywood all the time. Um, yeah. From Zanuck on downwards, there were, I, I really don't know, 2,000 people at least working on the lot, if not more. The huge departments of art department, sound department, dubbing, editing, production, everything. Huge quantities of buildings and people. And um, they made some marvellous pictures and they turned out 25 every year. Yeah. One a fortnight. Cool. But... Um, and then I'd, you know, I'd worked at Denham in the old days, the old Corder studio, which again was a huge enterprise with dozens and dozens of people. And then I came to this, and the whole thing was a wonderfully smooth operation, run by about five people, and a secretary and a telephone operator. And I admired that. I thought, well, it could be done this way. It's, um, there are no committees. <laughs> there are no extended discussions and wrangles and so on. 1763, a well was being dug. In 1927, the underground station, and now the extension. And that was uh, Duncan, Duncan, Lamont. Duncan Lamont, yes. Mm. A very good actor. And uh, he had... I'd worked with him before on the original BBC uh, Quite a Mouse Experiment, in which he was the man who turned slowly into a monstrous thing. Mm -hmm. And um, we did six episodes. Five of them had been shot with Duncan's as himself. And then he had to disappear from the thing because he had turned into the monstrous thing. But he came along to the live TV studio and helped to make his successor out of all sorts of vegetable matter which I had to organize. And uh, Duncan was right in there, so as a, almost surviving himself as the monster. Oh, I reckon this little beauty would cut through anything. I did steel armor plate with it, six inches thick, just like that. 
Oh, it was legal. Well, they have already. <laughs> this this drill was quite a problem to to mock up. Yeah. Because um, it had to be something very special. Because they, they, in the story, we've already seen that they tried an ordinary drill, which didn't, didn't work. And um, so we had to rig something which looked different and much more powerful, particularly. All clear. Right. You can get clear if you want to. There's still time. I don't think you've got the name Quatermass, which I got out of a London telephone directory, incidentally. Um, is that they were not used in the American versions. The American titles were awful. And also they destroyed the continuity of the three stories, which yes. is elementary. They lost it. Yes, We're great. calling this one Five Million Miles to Earth, whatever that's supposed to mean. A terrible title anyway. It meant absolutely nothing, didn't it? And the two previous ones, on the, in England, those stories on the BBC, Quatermass Experiment, Quatermass 2, Quatermass and the Pit, and because the name Quatermass is good, and it's a fairly memorable name. It's a brand name. People, yeah, people looked for them and were, well, here comes the next one. That was blown completely by the American distributors. Very foolish. And so now there is some kind of struggle continuing about remakes. And of course, that is a problem. They would have to remake the titles back to the originals. Some sort of freak vibration must have been. All right, Slatton. Mm. The drill. It wouldn't work. Rony, the sound, everything here, just like the old accounts. Did she tell you? Yeah. And there's a pentacle drawn inside there. What? See for yourself. As soon as you can. Thank you, Sergeant. Well, more arguments. Do you want to have another bash? Good man. Green, wait. We ought to have time to consider this. I have. We'll blanket down the sun with sandbags. I've ordered them down. and will cover up the polished surface. But it isn't as simple as that. Quite a mass. I thought you said the drill had no effect. Well, I never made that. What? But you must have. I can't have done. That's much bigger than my drill bit. Well, it doesn't look as if it was drilled at all. It looks more like melted. All right, Slatton, get out of here. Could you tell us a little bit about this effect? Well, that, would have, that was done by the special effects people. Uh, the... Not this, because this is sort of live action, if you see what I mean. It's not really live action. There they are. 
the fabulous creatures. But the crackle effect was just simply animation. It was, you know, it was a kind of animated mm. drawing. They've been dead for a long time. What are they? Whatever they are. We well, had uh, first. a very experienced man doing it. it was, yeah. I don't know if you ever met him. I don't suppose you did. No. It no. was called Les Bowie. Yeah, I know the name. Yes. It was a high reputation as a special effects man. I don't think I dare wait. They're corrupting so fast. Potter! Catching up on lost time. What do you mean by that? They were, so they were responsible for building the creatures and... and, um... entirely to your specification, I may say. But, um... And the uh, the sort of honeycomb effect was plates of plastic, uh, co um, what do you call it, transparent plastic, and they're all rigged so that on cues they could be pulled apart for, or appear to fall apart. But I must tell you that. I don't entirely approve of telling everybody how it was done. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think it destroys the illusion. I know it's interesting, but um, I think it's a pity in many ways. Yeah. There's too much of it going on. There's the movie behind the movie, you know, yes. and all this sort of stuff. It, I quite agree. I don't think it's good entertainment. I don't think it really contributes anything. I suppose they get a certain amount of publicity about it, but uh, out of it, but... Um, God. Throw down something to put this on. These are really quite successful, you know, I think, looking at them again. I haven't seen it for 30 years. I don't know you know, that it, it, this film, I, I don't know about the others, but it's extremely popular in France. Is it really? Mm. Mm. Oh, yes. Um, I was at Dinar two or three years ago. They did a retrospective of some of my other movies, but this was one of them, and they absolutely adored it. They really did. Went down a bomb. And um, not long before that, I was in Paris once. I fell in with a film journalist who told me that his he had a group of... Um, science fiction journalists, or, you know, critics, film critics who were really um, ma mainly interested in science fiction pictures. And they had decided that Quatermass and the Pit was, was one of the ten best science fiction films ever made. Oh, well, that's nice. You know, starting out yeah. with um, Nostromo and, you know, all those famous ones of the early German silence and all that yeah, sort well, of yes. thing. Nosferatu. Oh, yeah. That one. Yeah. Which I didn't, didn't really care for at all, I might say. But there you were. We were in good company. Yeah. yeah. What are you using? But it's nice to know. It's a great comfort. You make a film, don't you? I mean, you write a story. And you must wonder, I often wonder, is anybody going to see this? I mean, is anybody actually going to look at it? You know? <laughs> Well, that is a, it is a point. We see again. We go back to the antecedents, which uh, the BBC originals, which uh, were certainly not ever intended for a cult audience. Uh, there wasn't any. The, no, the, no. The, the whole audience in, in, uh, for television in England was small, and so it had to grab them. So there's no question of appealing to a science fiction hooked audience. It was for the general public, and that. That's right. I, it was, for me, a much better uh, way of writing it and telling it. Yes, uh, well, I came across this, another aspect of the same, from the same sort of thing. Um, when I went on with Hammer and made a horror picture for the first time, I'd never made a horror picture before, but I didn't approach it as being a horror picture that had to be in mm. a particular horror style, um, 
Chris Lee was in it and it was all about Dracula. Yeah. So obviously it was going to be a that sort of that sort of movie. But um, I think you know that it's always annoyed me slightly about Hammer's reputation, which these days is very high in a limited sense. But nevertheless, it's it's uh, the generality of the stuff is very well thought of by a lot of people. And somehow or other, it never got the proper recognition that it should have had at the time, particularly in England. Um, I think that it was simply neglect on the part of the critics, on the part of... Well, they were never taken very seriously uh, over a lot of years, and all the... the um... Uh, well, they went bust. This is what happened to them. Right, they won the Queen's Award and then they went bust. Yes. And uh, that really did no good at all because they ceased to make any. They weren't, they weren't able to right. any films. Uh, they were taken over by a receiver in law and uh, and sort of then cheapened themselves or were cheapened by uh, doing a sort of a few half hour and or one hour films which were labeled hammer horror yes and that was a terrible thing to do because then but now the phrase hammer horror has got stuck into the the whole all the, uh, the write-ups you know yeah, yeah. it's used as a, a, a pejorative a comment on the thing on the if any uh, uh anybody or some critic wishes to knock a, a current film he uses the word hammer horror. This looked like a hammer horror. Yes. You see, yes, and exactly. which is a, a cheap and horrible thing that grew out of their or their successes attempt to make a bit of money out of it, out of the wreck. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. But even in its heyday, you see, I feel that people in the industry used to look upon the. Uh, the Hammer Pictures as they came out was perfectly efficient, uh, working well for their public, uh, their audience that they'd managed to find, and uh, presuming that they made they made money, they made a little bit of money. They never made a lot yeah. of money. They never really, they never had, really had a huge bankroll behind them. And I think that um, Jimmy was far too quick about spending it on the next picture rather than yes. Yeah, sitting back and letting it earn for him or something like that. But um, so I think the p people in the, in the film industry seem, seem to take a kind of comfortable view that, well, we don't have to worry about them, we don't have to bother about them, they're perfectly happy doing what they're doing and it all works and it's, um, so don't interfere with it. And so it was neglected. But they did make some quite good movies. How many of these ape creatures? Seven. Well, six at least we found. Apes with oversized craniums. Some faculties had developed in them. Or had been developed. What? The will to survive. It's an odd phenomenon. Ronnie, if we found that our Earth was doomed, say, by climatic changes, what would we do about it? Nothing. Just go on squabbling as usual. Yes, but if we weren't men. I'm sorry to interrupt. But is it possible to give out a statement of some kind? The crowd outside is getting huge and a bit ugly. Are those the photographs you took? Yes. Right. Let's show them. Good idea. The discovery might have some astounding implications, added Professor Quatermass. But for the moment, he could not say what these were. Tests are being continued in the Because I think that when you come to stage a scene, say, like, for instance, this one we're watching, um, you want a fairly wide shot to start with to show more or less where we are. We've been in this set before, so we know where we are. And you want an entrance for the minister, so he flings open the door and comes charging in. And then you start to follow the dialogue and the directions in the script. The script is the basis of it always. Is you've, 
you know, the director starts with nothing if he hasn't got a script, and, right? So a good director can improve a script, and sometimes a, a script which isn't a very good script can be saved by a bit of rewriting and a bit of tarting up here and there, but we're not talking about that in this instance. It so happens because this script was shot almost exactly word for word as you printed it, was it? as you wrote oh, it. Well, that's nice. I'm glad it's hardly... Uh, <laughs> I just looked at my my old copy of the script and there's only about six pages which have been in any way rewritten and they were just slightly condensed or a few more words were put in to explain yeah, something, yeah. something very, very simple with nothing structural, nothing to do with the story or the characters or whatever. And so you feel your way through the scene, don't you? You know, you, just, you, you follow the, the characters... When you direct a film for Hammer, do you or would you follow it through post production? Five million years ago, it may have been very different. The film is not finished when you finish shooting. There's a tremendous amount to be done. Tremendous amount. Well, there's always a lot more juice to be squeezed out of that particular orange. Yeah. You know, when you start editing. They may have wanted to find another colony when their own world was doomed, but couldn't endure our atmosphere. So they experimented. Experimented. The man apes found beside the missile were abnormal. And the insects were responsible. There's clearly some connection. My guess is that those were ape mutations being brought back for release on Earth. And you really believe that this was possible? that apes were systematically taken from this planet to another, and... They were, because the editor works normally to what they call the floor timing. That is, in other words, the timing that the director set <coughs> on the set with the actors. This scene, is, is, as you see, is, is um, made up of a number of setups, so quite a lot of setups in this, in this scene. It had to have it because it's a battle between... Crater Mass and the other, these two. And what I liked and enjoyed and intended was that it was actors acting, which is the best thing you can have. Um, instead of what you get in now, maybe not not the very now, but a few years ago now, when one might have had uh, a science fiction thing about whatever it is that comes from outer space and you see it glowing. And you get this awful cliche thing of actors all being told, to look over that way, that's where we're going to put the special effects in. And uh, they all oh, look yes. sometimes not yeah. quite online, the faces all looking hopefully and not having the foggiest idea whether they're being deeply horrified or pleased or satisfied or whatever, but all trying to react to something that isn't there, waiting for maybe wow. months later when somebody will plonk in the... Uh, some clever bit of uh, wizardry. Oh, I think acting for the cinema is uh, is very difficult. Um, the trick you have to learn, of course, is that you don't act. You're supposed to be the character. And given that, then you're going to give a good performance. Yes. These boys are acting for each other. Though. Yes, exactly. This is, this is it, because you have to create the proper atmosphere around them. The set has to be right. Their mm. clothes have to be right the moves that they're asked to make, all that. You see, I've used one or two of them to move about the set, which really yeah. takes me over from one yeah. fella to another, like that, yeah. you see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that it all looks absolutely natural. People don't realise that there are cuts being made. They think it's all mm. one continuous piece of film yes. anyway. So, But so you, you, you get them moving about. Now, he's gone, so you can come in on him as he gets this call. Um but the the creation of a of a absolutely valid atmosphere around them is, I think, a tremendous help to actors. Nothing but a gigantic false alarm. Move along. And when they get in a scene together, you had in that in that previous scene there were what there were one, two, three, four, four, four or five of them in that scene, all very experienced performers, every one of them. And once you've rehearsed it, blocked in the moves, worked out that, then you, I always add the camera afterwards. I like mm. to get the scene running between the actors. Now they get 
to know each other and they know exactly who's going to come in with what and when and all that sort of thing. And then I usually add the camera in afterwards, funnily enough. I don't, I don't use the, the camera. I'm, I'm much more of an actor's director anyway, but um, I don't use the, the camera as a, as a personality. Yeah. Uh, I prefer people to forget there is such a thing as a camera. But the fact that it moves around, it zooms in, it zooms out, it pans, it tracks, it cranes, it does whatever it does, changes focus, hundreds of things you can do with it. But the, the public shouldn't be, a, the audience shouldn't be aware of any of that. Hey, come off it. My toolbox. Hey! Army. Let's go home! Where was Moses when the lights went out? Of course, you see, one of the things that, um, if anybody, as they say, if somebody says, well, the, the, there is an idea to remake this, or indeed all the Quatermass stories, um, no harm in that. Um, but the, the, the thing that could be improved, no doubt, after 30 years of development, is all the, effect, the special effects that you can now have. Now, the, of course, uh, I quite see that uh, it's a very valid opinion that, that the special effects these days are now overdone just because yes. they are so elaborate and so clever and so... Um, uh, the, the, you let your imagination run right with a computer and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so it's overdone to a certain extent. But when you make a film like this, in many ways the limitations of the special effects make you work to make them real, to, you, you see, here's a, here's a case where actually nothing, there's no special effect in this at all. Uh, it's except that you've got a man up on the, on the uh, spot rail mm. uh, with a fishing rod uh, waving it about, and the, the lamp starts to move, and you've got a spanner. It's all on bits of string, or you know, fine piano wire, or whatever it is, fishing line. And nowadays, that could be done probably much more elaborately. But whether it's um, whether it's altogether desirable, I'm not. I'm, I would think absolutely not. I think though you got it there completely. I think we did well, I must say. And yeah. I had a marvellous assistant director, a fellow called Bert Batt. He was um, a real dynamo, marvellous man to work with. Mm. And he, he suited me absolutely ideally. The two of us worked together marvellously. That's one reason why the picture was shot and, and went through so smoothly. He was an absolute ace at marshalling these various mm. effects and the people who were going yeah. to do them. People switching on fans and switching them off and flashing lights and fishing rods and all those things. But, um, oh, if I had my time over again, I don't suppose I'd do it very much differently. No, I hope you wouldn't, because I think it's marvellous the way it is. Well, thank you very much. It's, I, I'm only too pleased to to to, to, um, to satisfy the writer. Oh, well, it does Once that. or twice in my career, <laughs> I've had a lot of blame from the writer, <laughs> not fulfilling the great imagination and all the rest of it. Yes, I think I think one can overdo the effects. You see, yes. because the effects are no good at all unless the actors are doing it. Yeah, they're the ones who sell mm. it. They yeah. sell the idea to the audience. Yeah, not flying cups and saucers. Not, uh, no, it's the actor. It's the other way round, actually. Yeah, I find it interesting how you write about the mystic and ancient folklore rather than about science fiction and rocket ships. Well, I don't know anything about science. <laughs> which <laughs> cuts a lot of it. Uh, I suppose that's from it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I do know a bit about myths and superstition and things like that. Uh, so I suppose that's what I used. 
Uh, I come from the Isle of Man, you see, which is an island in the middle of the Irish Sea between England and Ireland, and which has always been riddled with superstition and mythology of um, a, little, a non-English kind of all sorts of very dangerous things. Uh, it was either that or smuggling. Those are the two things we were good at. <laughs> He's in here. Now, you see, Brian Dunleavy would have marched in like General Patton and slapped him. You <laughs> would you? Yeah. Well, he didn't get the chance this time, did he? No. She is very... When you've got something like Barbara Kent, Barbara Shelley, the moment he's, she starts to spout and expresses his horror and fright, terror of the, what's happened to him has been possessed, pop in a quick close-up of her and her reaction, which pumps up the scene 100%. Yeah. That's all yeah. you have to do. She doesn't even say anything. Yes. Which, that's movie. Tonight in the excavation. I remember being there. You stayed to dismantle some equipment. You were hurt by something flying through the air. Do you remember objects doing that? Moving by themselves? Yeah! I had to run to get away. They were coming. Who? What were? Them. Them! No more, please. I remember it started, and then I could only see them, like you found down there, with the eyes and horns and... You saw the creatures. They were alive. Alive? Help me. Like they must have hundreds and hundreds. I knew I was one. How did they move? Jumping. Leaping! Let him alone! Where? Well, I noticed that each of the films says something about contemporary society, a reflection of the time in which it was done. Yes, well, you, you have to. You're using uh, references that mean something to the contemporary audience, so you, you can't help um, doing that, which is, you know, this radio thing that uh, Andrew Keir and I did a year ago, it was to actually investigate exactly what uh, sources might show in these old, the original, certainly the original extended Quatermass things on the BBC, uh, had we found quite a lot. Um, and you can't help it, it means more to the audience, it clicks more, things uh, ring bells without, if it's done reasonably well, without their being too aware that they are being uh, given those references. Well, that's that's one of the things that appealed to me so strongly is that um, there, there were a lot of comments about um, political society at the time, the um, mood of the times, the um, events that were going on. As you said, the H-bomb had just been invented and things were on a very, very slippery slope, or at least we thought so at the time, didn't we? Yes. And um, thank heaven it never came to, never came to pass and it turned out that um, I think everybody was so frightened of these things that they, they didn't use them. But um, so that was a boom. But the, the the best thing about it is the way you present it is without hitting on everybody on the head with these things. And they, they, it's just there. It's in the background of the all the characters and the things they say to each other and their their attitudes to each other, the military attitude, the political attitude, and the professorial, uh, scientific, um, blue sky kind yeah. of attitude. Uh, those are three themes running for you all the way through this piece. But you don't have to say anything about it at all, actually, directly. It, you, you shouldn't you, have to, no. It yeah. should just be latent. It's there. It's and, always uh, there, all right? Yes. I reckon. I loved it, I must say. I want you to bring some gear to London right away. You see, too many pictures these days where people are arguing a political point or saying that how dreadful it is that these women have illegitimate children or whatever it is and it shouldn't be, or it should happen or it shouldn't happen or whatever. 
and it just doesn't work. They don't get their own point over. That's what <laughs> I think is so ridiculous. They, they try too hard. Now, one thing I, I'm pleased with was this this on the screen now. Uh, the uh, I think I call it the optic encephalograph or encephalograph, which was a machine that had right. not been invented. It's it's amazingly close to the things people put around their head for virtual reality. But this was that's after right. all that's right. thirty years ago, and uh, nobody had even sort of smelt that one yet. But uh, here we are using it. Oh yes. Well, yes, you see, it's, it's another, if you don't mind me saying something, you're very clever about it was those a good sort guess. of things. Because, well, no, it's not only a good guess, but you never go too far with it. If you if you yeah. go too far with it, it will then become absurd and unbelievable. Yeah. But your stuff is always believable. This is the great, the subtlety of it, the way it's used. Right. It's, Transmission centers. You better stop the grills. You betting? Nancy Parker's out. Mr. Neal, you blew quite a mass to Adams about uh, 15 years ago. Ah, uh, but not um, terrible. The timing was very carefully placed, believe me. And that was the this thing we did a year ago. It was supposed to have happened before he got blown to Adams, such as about uh, five years earlier than that. And it was neatly placed. It took place in a house he had bought in uh, the wilder parts of Scotland, where he is visited by a young woman who wants to write this biography. And at the end of it, he says, well, I think I will go to London someday. Oh, you really want to follow it through? He did, and he got blown away. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any chance of another quite a mass adventure in that? Well, time? I've always thought occasionally the one thing you could do would be, and this is not an original thought, the young Quatermass, <laughs> and you put it about pre-war, about 1936, I think, when he would have been, what, 30-odd younger. And uh, at that time, the young Werner von Braun, was just beginning to get interested in rocketry. So young Quatermass might go to Germany to do a bit of spying. And then you get a story. As a young man, he meets young Mr. von Braun. And it was the year of Jesse Owens' Olympics, wasn't it? When Hitler made a big, big pitch for the world's attention. It's getting too much for me. We're not getting you. Shout louder. I have to come out of here. It's getting too much for me. I'm coming out. What's happening? Rudy, it's Barbara. She's the one. Get down here, quick. I can see. Rudy. I can see. She's good, isn't she? She's good. She's very good. The direction is I'm pretty with well. it. Excellent. <laughs>
Yeah, well, that was sort of the idea that um, the basic thing, of course, was this whole thing that um, our bad side is a very, very ancient inheritance that the Martians pushed in into the genes. Now, that's another one. Uh, that was stretching it a bit, saying that uh, genetic material, meaning us, could be altered. Well, in the last year, we know it can. Come 1996, 7, we know it can. So it's possible. If there had been Martians, and if they knew that their place was washed up and they decided to kind of infect us with their special kind of intelligence, well, it is just possible the means now exist. So, if they send uh, rockets to Mars, you never know what they might hit. They might find Martians with ill disposition. More than most of them. And what do you claim this will show? A race purge, a cleansing of the Martian hives. Tape ready? An interesting aspect of the film is that it seems to be that no one behaves stupidly. No one goes into a darkened room or nobody's... Well, these, these are rational people, or they think they are. They're employing all their rationality to make a, a terrible mistake, which is what people do, isn't it? Yes, indeed. There's so, so many movies that you see... Uh, the the ground is cut from under their feet when the girl goes into the wrong room or you know, you know perfectly well that she's going to be nabbed or grabbed or something's going to happen. Yeah, uh, that's okay as a sort of melodramatic convention. Yes, but it's not drama, and there's no idea behind it. No idea. But if there is no idea, it's a, let's get the, the girl into a darkened base. room. Yeah. yeah, that's all. That's all there is. But without a sort of a strong idea that kind of permeates the whole thing and hangs over it and causes the nar narrative to happen. That's right. Uh, there's nothing, nothing at all worth telling. This truly remarkable apparatus of yours was surely set to detect was it not hallucination? Hallucination. Oh, no, exactly. All right, let's call it mental image. Now, this young lady certainly has an imagination, and she's overwrought. She's seen the creatures that Colonel Breen insists are fakes. So what can be more natural than... No, sir, you mustn't dismiss it like that. You prefer that I dismiss Colonel Breen's theory? But if you'd been there, if you'd witnessed it all... Professor Quatermass, I don't believe that you're right in this matter. You are ridiculously wrong. You're going to admit people to the excavation? Yes, tonight. The press, radio, and television. No, sir, you must not. My duty now is to quieten public alarm. And you, up till now a government officer with the same duty, you'll keep your damn paws out of things! Can 
we had such a good team. We had such a good, um, and as I say, keep on saying, a good script. And um, the schedule was short. I can't remember what it was, but it certainly wasn't very long. But um, everything went as merry as a marriage bell. It really did. It, it uh, may not look it from the screen, but um, we had no real hold-ups or problems. It's one of the happiest pictures I've ever made, believe me. Now, before we take you down to see for yourselves, any questions? Yes, I should say. Uh, hardly at all. I think I was on some other thing which uh, I could only get about one day uh, to escape from and go up and watch this. Um, and I think it was one of the times where nothing uh, highly dramatic was going on anyway. And a writer at that point is only a nuisance. There's nothing to contribute. I mean, the, the contribution time had long passed. So, oh, mate, he's in there! Oh, it's it's safe. Right. The power's been cut! I don't need that. What happened? He had the live cable. He must have slipped. Did you have any input on design? Oh, yes. You, once you've got the script, then, uh, to put it at its lowest, the director, the director is the chairman of the committee. Um, we had the art director, in this case, the art director, casting director, production manager, first assistant, cameraman, and in this case, of course, very much dominant, the uh, special effects department. And you go through the script and you discuss everything at, at great length and uh, in incredible detail. It was a very well prepared picture. That's true. I don't. I can't remember how long we had to do it, but we certainly had quite a long preparation period, which was invaluable because, um, as they used to say, time spent on reconnaissance is never wasted. Well, I mean, the budget is, um, is good of you to ask about it, but the point is that I never really had anything to do with the budget. Um, I was relying entirely on the production manager and the producer, both highly experienced men. And when you take a script within certain reason, um, with the application of common sense, you can say exactly how long it's going to take to shoot it. And if it's going to take too long, then you have to do something about that. But if it fits into a reasonable time scale for production and cost, then um, then you go ahead and that's it. You make the film on that basis, hoping that nothing will go wrong and you know, if the predictions are all being scrupulously worked out that it will come out just like that, just like it's intended to do. Um, so I have never, all my lifelong career, <laughs> I've never had um, any close interest in the budget. The, sh the schedule I like to look at simply because it tells me um, how much time is allocated to any particular set or location or whatever it is. So that's something that I have to fit into. But um, I couldn't tell you what the budget was on this picture at all. It was a fancy idea. I'm sure nobody ever told me.
Well, I think I had the original idea about uh, a couple of years before we did it, or a year anyway. And uh, I said to Rudy Cartier, who was uh, my old chum from the the original Quatermass days, uh, why don't we do one? Well, they dig a hole and they find a spaceship. He said, "Let's do it," with which was much faster than you could get anything through the BBC today. <laughs> so from then on, I, I worked on it, and I wrote a very extended treatment, which I didn't usually do, um, a very full treatment, so that they could uh, take in all the preparatory work, the sort of a spe special effects that we, in fact, did eventually when we got to them. And uh, then, of course, uh, that all happened. It must have happened during a year at intervals. Um, so we were well prepared again. It was really a very well prepared show you know, on television. And uh, there were lo uh, a lot of filmed inserts which went in there. Um, and so we, then we had the experience of actually doing it on television. And then years later, two or three years after that, I got involved in the Hammer Project. And the main purpose was to shrink it down to half the length without losing essentials. This sort of scene was what we didn't have enough of in the BBC version because they couldn't afford even that number of extras. It was all right, but it wasn't. This is where the, the greater number of facilities shows. Yes, of course, in television these days they have a tremendous scope. Um, I rather oh, today, yes, I don't know. I rather envy them. Yes. Frankly. But, um, yes, you expect mm. more scope mm -hmm. with that. Um, you see, film. Dunleavy could never do this sort of thing at all. Couldn't have touched it. If, if, he, if he'd been up for playing the thing again, I would have written a scene in. <laughs> Get that inside you. You stopped me? That's right, I stopped you. You were being carried along, so I thought I'd better. Were they? People. What? Of course they were. Don't you feel it? Feel what? Oh, Mr. Neal, how did the fourth... Quatermass come about? Oh, that was has no connection. It was many years later. Uh, it they, originally the BBC said can't we do another one? 
and then decided it was cost too much. And so it was handed over to, eventually, ITV to do it, and it became a very expensive production, indeed. Not a lot of which showed on the screen, in effect, because I think I thought the casting was never right. And although the the production values were excellent, a lot of it didn't work. Also, maybe it wasn't as good a story. That's done to me. I can feel it. It's getting stronger. Quite a mass. Go! Quite a mass, go! Terrible thing happened there when that bar stool was thrown in. It hit James on the head. Oh, really? Mm, it really God. did. Oh, Jim, they are. I'm really shaken over that. He made nothing of it, but it really, really? Hurt, him. really hurt him. Yes. Can do a lot of damage, though. Oh, yes, those things can come out of them. Professor of Physics. Control the British Experimental Group. At present, engaged. Engaged. <laughs> Wanted to kill you. Mr. Neal, could you tell us a little bit about the structure of Quatermass 4? Uh, it was written as four episodes, four pieces, and it was, and it had the peculiar thing in order to try and um, reduce the, or uh, not reduce the budget, but um, be able to afford it. Uh, it was designed to be cut automatically into a feature film length instead of reducing it like this one. It was designed to be cut, and I think this was a bad idea. It was like pulling a handle and a lot of the counters dropped out. Um, and so things failed to connect. Not a good idea, not a way to do it, and I don't think anybody's tried it since. See, all this is excellent. If you use fairly confined sets, concentrate mm. on the people. You don't need so many people, and you don't need such a vast set. And really, to tell mm. the story, which is that uh, this poor devil is, is bottled up in some alleyways, they can't get out because the Martian people have become possessed, the people are more susceptible yes. to the influence. Um, and you just stand there like a like a wall. Oh, that's nice. Now that's a model of this. Yeah. Is there a second unit director on this uh, picture? Wow. No, there was no second unit, as far as I know, except the, the uh, special effects people who did all that sort of thing um, on their own. They were a sort of second unit, if you like. But otherwise, all these things were staged and done by the first unit. of all that's happening. 
the court. Oh, God. Uh, so I think, I think you got very well. That is really, there are three kinds of people in the world. And the, the people who uh, have a huge Martian inheritance in them, and uh, like the Colonel, Colonel Breen, yes. uh, who is pure Martian almost, strong yeah. in him. Quatermass, who's the kind of man in the middle, who's outgrown quite a lot of it in the five million years. And people like the James Donald character, Brony, who's completely outgrown it. Yes. And so he's able to survive and be himself when all the others are being overtaken. And uh, it's a bit like what you get in the Los, Los Angeles uh, race riot scene sometimes, isn't it? Yes. The fellows who will be unaffected, impervious, can resist the, the kind of awful crowd swell. And the ones who can't resist it. And the fellows who you see in the old films of Hitler's Nuremberg rallies, isn't they all cheering together? Yes, yes. In the original BBC version, which was much more studio bound, uh, we had uh, the Roney character, played by Cecil Linda, a Canadian actor, and he more or less sacrificed himself um, by deciding that he could uh, earth the thing, earth, which is it's an electrical phenomenon, and he said uh, to himself and to others, uh, I can throw. Um, a thing, uh, an iron, mass of iron, a piece of iron, steel, or whatever it is, into it and earth it, and maybe it's worth a try. And he does that and dies in the attempt. Now, in this version, we have the crane because Hammer produced this excellent crane. Yes, it were bits of a real crane, of course. Yeah. Um, the only thing we had to be rather discreet about was the apparition, this. Yeah. It's a bit of a cheat, bluntly, isn't it? Well, I... You've got to end it. You've got to have something there. Yes. I had uh, to have, we have to have something, quite clearly. You yeah. can't have nothing. But on the other hand... What do you have? People don't believe in the devil anymore. If you yeah. were to simply put up, um, it's the exorcising uh, of the devil, uh, yes. really, isn't it? That's, that's what it is. Yes, that's it. Fact. But you can't have a. There he uh, goes, and he kills himself. That was part model, part. Works, works very well. Special effects people were really very good. Yes. They're very well. Well, I'm delighted to be sitting here beside you and discussing well, <laughs> our mutual adventures. Yeah. And uh, uh, congratulations, that's all I can say, in a beautiful production. I'm only too grateful for a jolly good script, believe me. Well, it all worked together. Any? And uh, that's all. That's all one can hope for. And they're beautifully directed. Well, 
could you uh, explain a little bit about the confusion of the name Roy Baker? Oh, don't. Don't remind me of the endless confusion about Roy Wall Baker and who is he. Uh, I started out as Roy Baker, which is my name, and the name that I was baptized and, and registered and everything else. So that's who I am. But there's another Roy Baker who was a dubbing editor. And it went on for years, uh, the confusion. Eventually, he moved into the same tax district as I was oh. in. And that lit up the income yeah, tax so department. They thought, oh, we've got somebody who's got two incomes. And it's what you know, of course, not a, not a word of truth in it. And eventually, I got so desperate, it was with this picture um, that I, I remember the second assistant coming to me and saying, I'm just checking the script for the titles, you know, to get them more correct. Um, and you want directed by Roy Baker? So I said, no, Roy Ward Baker. We'll have another a new one. Ward being my mother's maiden name. That's how that came about. Well, it was a fatal mistake because when people, this picture came out, people all thought it was a new director called Roy Ward Baker. It wasn't dear old Roy Baker who'd been doing it for 20 years or more. There you are. It was a mistake. I should have stuck to my guns and told the other fellow to change his name. But uh, he wouldn't budge. He's still around. 